In today's podcast, we're going to discuss the common complaint of headaches. The vast majority of these headaches are harmless. It's our job to find the one case in a hundred that represents something more worrisome. Just as with every other diagnosis in medicine, the key is the history. By asking several key questions, you'll be able to determine with a fair bit of certainty just how worrisome any given headache should be, especially when combined with a good physical exam. As usual, you'll want to start with taking a good history, focusing on onset, anything that's made the headache better or worse, quality, radiation, severity, and timing. Make sure to get a clear picture about onset and intensity by asking if the headache came on suddenly, or did it start as a mild ache and gradually worsen to the point where they had to come to the ER. When the textbooks refer to a thunderclap headache, they're referring to the fact that the headache came out of nowhere and hit maximal intensity immediately. This is the classic description of a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Venous sinus thrombosis may also present with thunderclap headache. You'll also want to know if the patient has had similar headaches before. If they have, then what were they diagnosed as? Oftentimes, a patient will have a history of migraine, cluster, or tension headache. However, if the headache is new, and especially if it's described as the worst headache of their life, then further evaluation, usually with advanced imaging, is warranted as this is concerning for intracranial hemorrhage. Remember to find out if the patient has had any episodes of altered mental status, loss of consciousness, or seizure-like activity. While this suggests the obvious concerning diagnosis such as intracranial mass and bleeds, seizure-like activity should cause you to be concerned for eclampsia in the pregnant patient, and if the patient is not seizing but is pregnant, you should also consider preeclampsia. As part of your differential diagnosis, you should also screen for signs of infection, as this might suggest meningitis, encephalitis, brain abscess, or toxoplasmosis. Look for fever, chills, and recent infection, especially URIs. You should also remember to ask about HIV, chemotherapy, and any other cause of immunosuppression, such as organ transplant medications. One last bit of information to consider is the patient's age. While younger patients present more classically for any given type of headache, the headache seen in an older person can often trick you, as older individuals rarely present classically. For example, because of the brain atrophy seen in many elderly individuals, there's much more space for a bleed before they experience symptoms. Therefore, an intracranial hemorrhage might present with gradual rather than hyperacute pain. Additionally, the elderly are at higher risk for cancer, stroke, trauma, and thrombosis. Lastly, in anyone over the age of 50, temporal arteritis should also be considered. The treatment, steroids, are easy to give and can be vision saving. For your physical exam, you'll want to focus on the neurological exam. While the cranial nerve exam, strength exam, sensation exam, and reflexes are all important, if you could only perform one exam, examine for pronator drift. This finding is the most sensitive for intracranial abnormality. However, remember, a normal neurological exam and normal pronator drift does not definitively exclude significant intracranial pathology. It only stratifies the patient into a group that has a lower likelihood of intracranial abnormality. If you suspect an abnormality, the next step is to get some imaging. Usually that means a non-contrast CT of the head. The non-contrast head CT is great because it's fast and virtually always available. You also don't have to worry about all the issues associated with contrast. The only reason to add contrast is if you want information on the vasculature or you suspect a malignancy which might not be detected otherwise. Unfortunately, the CT is not very good at looking at the posterior fossa, which includes the brainstem and cerebellum. So if you're concerned with posterior fossa involvement, for example, if your patient is having central vertigo, an MRI would be indicated. Unfortunately, the MRI takes longer, and it's not always available 24-7. That concludes our podcast on headaches. Thank you for listening.